Good evening, JP Progressives. I'm going to try and remember to not gesture too much, uh, as is my habit with this microphone. So if you see me start to do that, let me know. Um, so I'm told that I have, a th I have three minutes, sort of do what you want with it time, and then we'll do questions. So um, I'm going to be not very formal with you guys, most, you know, many of whom I know and love from past campaigns. Um, I'm going to just motor through some of the things from this past uh, session that have been taking up my time, that I've been working on, that I put forward to you as sort of the best reasons that I can enumerate why you should send me back, and I hope you do. It would be a great honor. This, I mean, I tell people all the time, they say, do you, you know, are you having fun at this job? And I say, fun isn't exactly the right word, uh, <laughs> but, but that I love my job. I really love this job. It's a blessing to get out of bed every morning and know that you have this job where you get to go to work to fight for the values of your neighbors and your community and for um, the change that you want to see happen in the world. So I thank you for um, blessing me with that job for the last going on six years and, and I do ask humbly for you to send me back. So um, the quick sort of, uh, I guess what I'll call the greatest hits list and hopefully this will get your juices flowing for questions but if there's something that I miss, I know you guys won't be shy about questions. Um, the single probably uh, the you know, biggest thing from this session that I'm most proud of was uh, the legislature's action to raise the minimum wage in Massachusetts. Uh, as you probably know, we now have a nation leading in terms of statewide minimum wages, uh, uh, minimum wage of $11 once it's fully phased in over the next few years. Uh, we did not, unfortunately, the Senate bill, we, we indexed it to inflation in conference committee. We lost the indexing, but we kept the $11 instead of the $10.50. Um, that we were that was sort of the, the negotiation space in conference and that's what went to the governor's desk and thankfully although it was not a surprise he signed it um, so minimum wage is probably the, the single best one today was a big day also uh, many of you probably know that the governor signed into law the gun safety bill uh, that the legislature just passed uh, in the waning hours of our formal session uh, in the last week of July and that's something that uh, has huge impacts as you know for our district the second Suffolk district uh, I, I, I go, to, you know, it's a cliche to say this, but I'll say it anyways. I, I go to way more funerals uh, than I care to go to. And, and, you know, that's a normal part of the job for any elected official, but not that, they're, that they be funerals for kids. Uh, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15, up to, you know, 6, 17, 18 years old. It just should not be part of this job. Uh, and, and those are some of the images that are burned into my brain and that I carry with me in the legislature. So that bill, um, we can go more into detail, but I think it's a, a positive step for the state. Um, in the budget, we got a slight increase this year for youth jobs, uh, another really important issue, of, you know, sort of staple for fighting against violence in our neighborhoods. Uh, big, big year for election reform and campaign finance reform. We got two separate bills done on uh, sort of changing our election rules to make it easier for uh, underrepresented populations to vote, uh, and then a separate bill on the issue of campaign finance disclosure uh, to push back on some of the negative influences of um, the Citizens United, you know, floodgates of, of big money and sort of anonymous money in our political system. Uh, what else we got? There was an IT bond bill. This is sort of boring stuff, but Annie said bonding committee was her favorite, so I'll mention it. Um, we got uh, over $30 million in that IT bond bill for educational IT investments across the state. This is something that we need in our district, but I will say, um, you know, in a way that I hope you'll be altruistic toward other parts of the state. Whereas there's some parts of the state that they don't even have broadband connect connectivity in the schools, uh, and that's a real that's a real shame on us as a state. And so that's money that I that I hope is going to really get to the heart of that problem. Um, in the budget, again, that's another highlight. We put in another chunk of money to take down the wait list uh, for early education and care in our state. We have about forty thousand. Um, zero to five year olds on the wait list for early education and care. Sorry, I'm missing this, this line. My time is up. I didn't even get through my best and my greatest hits list. So I'll leave it there. EEC is a good place to, to stop because that's sort of the beginning and the end of it all. Um, so with that, who uh, I don't know if there's a sort of master of questions. There we go. Whoever's walking up to the mic. Yeah, it's a fair question. What's your name? Katie, good. it's a fair question. I'm glad you're asking it of me, um, both write, you know, writing in and get you know, here in a public forum so that other people who might have that question on their mind. So uh, there was this other thing going on that day in the legislature. And as you know, the legislature did this very quickly, um, which for many people was a relief to see. But in what that means in practical terms, I'm sort of a, I, I'm sort of a nudge about this. I like to read the bill before I sign on to it. And, um, 
you know, three pages is only three pages, but it's still three pages. Uh, and that, that bill was heard in committee, it was filed, and then within days heard in committee and passed into law the same day that it was heard in committee. So it was a very, it was a very fast track bill. That same day in the legislature that it was heard uh, and that it was passed, and again, I was proud to vote for it. So, you know, I, I want to say to you clearly, it was is a lot of support. Um, I, to be fair, you're endorsed by Planned Parenthood, so I know, I know you support Thank you. Thank you for getting that on the record there. <laughs> um, that there was this other big debate going on in the legislature that day on a bill that some of you heard a little bit about, uh, which is also con which is much more controversial, which was the issue of charter schools. And as the education committee chair, that's a bill that I had been working on for basically the last 12 months. And you know, in the few days leading up to it coming to the Senate, it was all it was doing all the time. Uh, you know, sort of 20 hours a day working on the final text, calling colleagues, answering questions about it, et cetera. So that was just an unlucky timing issue. That the question was about uh, the, the high number of children, and neither one of us is going to remember it exactly right, but I think right. you, get, you were guessing ballpark 7,000 uh, young people who are in DCF custody. Right. Uh, and why is that number so high? What is the root cause of that? And what are we doing about it as a state? So. Um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, be straightforward with you about what I don't know, you know, just in quoting that number, um, which is, I don't know if that number was before the spotlight was shown on DCF or after. Because of, as I'm sure will come as no surprise to folks here, and it does not to me, I, I suspect, and I think that this is not contested, that uh, in the wake of the the failings that have been exposed and the horrible death of that boy, yes. uh, that DCF is being much more, um, uh, I don't know if you want to call it vigilant or aggressive, you know, whatever uh, adjective you want to attach to it, but that when reports are made to them, um, they're going to be much more likely to go in and, and strongly intervene, and in many cases, remove a child from the household, rather than be um, left with the charge of you under you under intervened, right, and left a child in a dangerous situation. So I think we are going to see a spike um, in the numbers, and I don't know. It may be that that is appropriate, right? If there was a if there was levels of under intervention happening before. So the question of what are we doing, yeah. right? Yeah. I again, I think that that is an unanswered question of what are the root causes. We know that there, you know, is is really problematic. Um, levels of both poverty unto itself and polarization of wealth going on in our state as in our country, which is a driver of so many things that I'm fighting against in the legislature and that I know JP Progressives cares about. I want to be cautious about drawing a direct causal line um, between poverty and child abuse because of course we know there are many, many, many low-income families who are wonderful parents, wonderful households, um, but I think it is, a, you know, it's a factor that we need to consider, right, are the, in, in, for example, in cases of neglect rather than proactive abuse. Um, and so that's an open question in my mind, and I think we need to look carefully at that. So that's going to be ongoing work. What I can tell you the legislature has done thus far yes. is that in the budget this year, we did make um, a, 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 a material commitment um, to the Department of Children and Families to increase the number of line caseworkers that can be out there so that the caseloads are, so, are not so astronomically high. Um, that, that line caseworkers are not able to do the kind of um, rigorous follow-up that we would expect of them. Okay. Um, I hope you'll stay in touch with us as Absolutely. in the district. And, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, I was just saying, I'm hoping you'll stay in touch with this as constituents in the district because um, I think that's a, 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 this a critical group. Um, and yeah. we, should, we, not, we shouldn't lose a generation again. For sure. I mean, I think it's, some, I think it's shameful to yeah. tell the truth. So. Whatever we, I we can do to help, I'd be delighted to be helpful in whatever I can. I genuinely thank you for that. And I, and I would like to sort of put the general call out there to others that we really rely on um, you know, your average citizen resident um, to be eyes and ears and to help hatch theories you know, for us about what do you think the root causes are. I will say that in the wake of all of the, the scrutiny, the public scrutiny on DCF, my office received a huge spike in calls from um, foster parents, from parents, from DCF workers, everyone you know in that space calling in to just talk more about what are the things that they observe in the system. And it, you know, it, it's hard for us to deal with a spike like that, but we need to be hearing 
um, that kind of input in order to better manage the system. I, one other, actually, one other thing I would mention is um, substance abuse. I think is one clear driver um, that we are seeing that as we see a spike in opiate abuse, um, that there's connections there uh, between child abuse and neglect and substance abuse. And we did, again, you know, it's not going to solve the whole problem, but the legislature did pass a substance abuse treatment bill that requires now in, uh, health insurance companies to cover um, to cover inpatient treatment, in a, so that we can increase the level of access to that. So did folks hear the, the question? Okay, so I'll try and repeat. So the question was, um, in the wake of the passage of the transgender rights bill, um, which I was very proud to co-sponsor, and you know I consider that simply the right thing to do, um, which we did get passed last session. Um, I'm sorry, tell me your name one more time. Christine Carlin. Christine was saying there's still a, a sort of awareness process that needs to be gone through where people don't know uh, you know, the new protections that exist in law. People are still being victimized of hate crimes. Um, and in particular, how can we spread more awareness about this for young people who don't necessarily know the, the rights and protections that they have under the law in the wake of the passage of the bill? So, you know, this is a place where um, legislation isn't always the right tool. You know, we can only legislate someone. We can't legislate awareness, right? It, it is a process um, that all of us have to be a part of. You know, passing a bill definitely helps because it's a hook for getting media coverage on the issue. Um, but we also, you know, groups like Bagley, groups like JP Progressives, um, particularly where young people are concerned, of course our education system um, is a big part of uh, the sort of delivery system for awareness. Um, we also just did pass in the legislature this year um, another bill of which I was a sponsor, which is a sort of round two of the anti-bullying bill uh, to, to specify some of the, vulner you know, the, the, the groups that tend to be the most statistically vulnerable to bullying in schools, including LGBTQ youth, um, to make sure that school personnel are more attuned to those risk factors. Uh, so my hope is that they in turn, you know, they be they're being more aware and schools having to have proactive plans in place um, to prevent and address bullying when it occurs will help make young people more aware uh, as well as more protected. Uh, there's also been implementation work that the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has done in the wake of the transgender bill. Um, so it's a place actually in, in some ways where young people might have um, a, a more direct path um, to implementation than adults who are out in the broader world. The Department of Elementary and Secondary Education was very direct with schools across the state in saying Here's how you need to implement the trans rights bill within the K through 12 public school space. So, for example, bathrooms in schools, right? How if you have a transgender student in a school, what are the rules there? Um, and I'm, you know, I'm hesitant to say that because, of course, we don't like it to be. It's not the bathroom bill. And it, in fact, it wasn't since we had, took out public accommodations in the end to get the bill passed. Um, but within the space of schools. It is, a, it is a question that schools had for the department, and the department was direct about you need to allow students to use the whatever facility, whether it's a locker room or bathroom, that they self-identify to. It's, a, it's an issue that has to be tackled from a few directions, like so much that we do in public policy, particularly in the education space where I'm most steeped, um, there's not one you know, silver bullet. Uh, in, this, in the housing space, I'd say a few prongs. One is that in the public sector, we need to do more and do better um, with providing, maintaining um, <coughs> the affordable housing stock that we control uh, so that when that does happen on private property parcels, that there are, are alternatives uh, for folks to go to. Uh, I would also say that long term, I really am a proponent of, um, of not pursuing a housing only strategy to housing problems uh, because the, the, as much as we can you know, try and um, slow down the pace of gentrification. Uh, I, I, I just, I, I don't think that the government is going to be effective at ending it. And so we need to get prepared for how do we make sure that people are not going to be displaced, um, but rather will be able to participate as a community develops and reap the benefits of it. And so you, you've got to do, you know, if, if the government pursues housing stock only strategy, some people are going to get left behind. And so we need to make sure that we're doing um, workforce development, education, all the things that make it so that the people who've been here for years and who have built up a community are going to be able to progress economically, you know, apace with the, the way that the, you know, the, the, the arc that the housing stock is going through. So that's, those are other prongs. Um, to,
middle income or higher. So, so the equation at the other end, the policy end, is Right. I mean, we have, to, we have to shift that fundamental dynamic, right? That there's going to be this growing number of very low income people. And then, you know, that the wealth is going to polarize in this smaller set of people who can drive this luxury housing market. So that, that's one thing I would say. Uh, directly to your question, there, and this is, I don't enjoy saying this, right? Because I like it when, um, you know, I have influence over things. But there are some limitations to where government can intervene when, there, when private property is sold from one private owner to another private owner and it doesn't involve you know, a change in zoning um, or something along those lines and there, that there's not an insertion point for government uh, to you know, come in and say, stop, you can't do this. So we have to use the tools that are available to us to influence all the other pieces that we can control. Um, I would cite uh, the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative as the best example that I've seen of where not the government per se, although the government as a partner, but that civic, civil society, you know, nonprofit groups, community members themselves have come in in the Dudley Street neighborhood over the last few decades. They've really pursued the strategy very strategically, intentionally, of, buy, of gaining control, ownership of the property. <coughs> themselves so that they will control the pace of development and the choices about development and the choices about tenants and home ownership and what they're going to charge so that they can maintain a level of affordability in the community and not be at the whim of you know, private developers who are not grounded and rooted in that community. So I always, I always raise up the example of DSNI and what they've been doing over in the Dudley area. And then the last thing I'll try and squeeze in really quickly is transportation policy. Again, we can't do it just with housing alone, that you have to have a mass transit uh, policy that expands what we can look to as our housing stock because there are more people who are trying to get housed in Boston than there are places to live in Boston, period. And if we don't change that supply and demand equation by adding to the supply that people can live in and still work in the city, then we're again going to be fighting these, these very disadvantageous, you know, fundamental mathematical dynamics. I think that was the last question, right? And, and that was our last question. I want to thank the senator for coming and spending time with us. Thank you for having me. Thank you.